The Honorable Cynthia Ford, Minister of People Empowerment and Elder Affairs on behalf of the Government of Barbados. The Honorable Leonard Montout, Minister of Equity, Social Justice, Local Government and Empowerment on behalf of the Government of St. Lucia. Dr. Carlene Radix, Head of Health and Acting Head of Human and Social Cluster, Social and Sustainable Development Division on behalf of the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States, OECS. Distinguished representatives from the governments of Barbados and St. Lucia. Excellencies, members of the Diplomatic Corps, development partners, heads of event agencies, funds and programs, and members of the media. The United Nations, Barbados and OECS is pleased to welcome you to the virtual launch of the SDG Fund Joint Social Protection Program entitled Universal Adaptive Social Protection to Enhance Resilience and Acceleration of the Sustainable Development Goals in the Eastern Caribbean. My name is Shereen Cuthbert, Communications and Information Management Officer for the International Labor Organization, ILO, Office for the Caribbean. We want to thank everyone today for connecting virtually to this launch. We would like to inform you that in addition to the Zoom platform, the event is being live streamed on YouTube. On some housekeeping matters, please note that all microphones will be muted except for speaker microphones. Participants are welcome to post comments or questions in the chat box. And please make sure that you indicate your name and organization when you're asking a question or making a comment. The microphone will be open during the question and answer section of the launch. We would like to recognize the participation of a representative from each of the implementing partners of the joint program. UN resident coordinator, Mr. Didier Trebouk is physically accompanied by Mr. Alloyd, La Alloys, excuse me, Kamuraji Ye, UNICEF representative for the Eastern Caribbean, and Mr. Regis Chapman, head of the World Food Program in the Caribbean, and virtually by the representatives of other participating agencies, the United Nations Development Program, UNDP, the International Labor Organization, ILO, and UN Women. Members of the United Nations sub-regional team of Barbados and the Eastern Caribbean are also virtually connected to this event. I now invite UN Resident Coordinator, Mr. Didier Trebouk, to deliver his welcome remarks. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this launch of the UN SDG Fund Social Protection Program for Barbados St. Lucia and the OECS. I want to especially welcome Honorable Cynthia Ford, Minister of People Empowerment and Elder Affairs from Barbados, Minister Lennart Montout, um, Minister for Equity, Social Justice, Local Government and Empowerment from the Government of St. Lucia, and Dr. Kaline Radix, uh, Head of the Health and Acting Head of the Human and Social Cluster from the OECF, thank you very much for your participation today. This is very, very highly appreciated. I want also to thank other uh, regional government representatives, excellencies, international development partners, member of the media, and of course, all of those who are following us uh, today from the Caribbean and elsewhere via uh, live streaming. I also want to recognize my uh, various colleagues from UN agencies, um, including the five participating agencies in this program. I have besides me uh, the two co-leads of this joint program, uh, UNICEF representative, Dr. Alois uh, Kamuraji, and uh, WFP representative, Regis Chapman. Uh, ILO deputy representative, also Lars Johansen is online, as well as a colleague from UNDP and UN, UN Movement. They are the five UN agencies. Uh, which will implement this joint program. So as a um, UN sub-regional team for, the, for Barbados and the Eastern Caribbean, we are extremely pleased to embark on this joint SDG fund program on social protection because partly this is the first pilot initiative of this kind in the Caribbean. And this is being launched under the new fund created by the UN Secretary General 
uh, with the UN development system reform for UN country team like us here in the Eastern Caribbean to work as one. And it's about specifically bridging the gap between traditional social protection and disaster risk management by introducing innovative approaches with a view to contribute to accelerating progress towards the sustainable development goals. It's also about how do we reach to those people most in need during times of crisis as we are facing now with COVID. So there is no better moment to launch this joint program today. It reflects our commitment as UN system to partner with the governments and the people of the Eastern Caribbean region to contribute to the transformational changes where seeds inherent vulnerabilities challenge the traditional development paradigm. And actually, three weeks ago, we were here uh, with most of you uh, today. Uh, we were gathering here to put the spotlight on seed vulnerabilities, and we launched a funding appeal. So today, we continue to observe a declining number of COVID active cases and the flattening of the curve across the Eastern Caribbean. However, the socioeconomic impact of this pandemic threatened the region long-term development. And the underlying inequalities and gaps in social protection, we know that they will need to be addressed while mitigating at the same time the risk for the 2020 hurricane season, which is now started. Many persons in the Caribbean are indeed facing a new normal, and this is going to last. But for now, it includes unexpected job losses reduced wages, job freezes, inability for some to access social services, or even the inability to feed their families, or even homelessness. Some households face a very dire situation due to the loss of employment by the main income earner. As all of this may only, all of this in the end will only erode the gains countries have made towards the achievement of the SDGs. So it is truly time to build wide partnerships to address those challenges, to help countries to increase social protection and restore livelihoods. And nothing but a coordinated response will be able to turn the situation around. Earlier this month, Prime Minister Norbert Mia Motley revealed that up to 26% of Barbados labor force had claimed unemployment benefits. And this was a part of the unemployment rate, which was already around 10%. And she stressed that the need to ensure that every household should have access to food. Recently, Prime Minister Anne Chastanet also painted a green scenario in St. Lucia where COVID-19 had adversely impacted all sectors, including in a 60% drop in government's revenue, hence making it hard, of course, to regain margins to maneuver. So we're very, very, of course, conscious of, of those issues and, and, and challenges for, that are very similar in most Caribbean islands. But in spite of these tremendous difficulties, I really want to commend the government of Barbados for, for example, for the introduction of the household survival programs amongst other initiatives, and the government of St. Lucia for its implementation of a comprehensive social stabilization program to support effective individuals and families. And this truly demonstrates government commitment to leave no one behind, despite the their fiscal, fiscal constraint, hence putting back hopes in families' futures. So now looking more specifically at how the UN were supporting those endeavors and how we respond, well, I want to say that COVID has demonstrated that we address um, has demanded that we address uh, the immediate challenges country has face, are facing. And as UN, we have responded to joint program by addressing Barbados needs by supporting the national insurance, insurance scheme information management, monitoring and outreach. And likewise in St. Lucia, we're responding with the expansion of social assistance, data collection and analysis. In both countries, as part of the UN broader support to COVID-19, through the recently launched multi-sector response plan, the resource pledged from the UN-India Partnership Fund will, for example, also provide cash transfer to expand 
the number of households under the national public assistance programs. I believe that for many decades, decades, the UN has been a faithful partner to the region as governments invest in social protection, resulting in important development gains. But a recurrent climate and socioeconomic threat demand that we go an extra mile to transform the traditional approaches. And the US 4.75 million investment from this joint program will leverage the expertise of five UN agencies, namely again, UNICEF, WFP, ILO, UNDP and UN Women, and maximize the impact of results through a broader coalition of partnerships with our development partners. We also seek to work collaboratively with the World Bank in St. Lucia and CDB and IDB, particularly in Barbados. And that should ensure that their policy loans, for example, and this initiative in particular, are carried out in a very complementary manner to maximize benefits for the most vulnerable. This is in the end what truly matters. So by the end of this two year joint program, we hope to have contributed to four specific areas. First, the strengthening of social protection systems with policies that link disaster risk management and adapting to climate change or other external shocks. Second, developing financing strategies that foster sustainability and increase access to social protection services towards universal coverage. Third, ensuring that social protection programs are equipped for crisis preparation and response. And finally, to replicate all the lessons we will have learned and those models that we'll have piloted in both countries to other Eastern Caribbean countries in partnership with the OECS and through the development of a social protection strategy. Addressing COVID challenges requires a collective effort. And I want really to thank all our development partners, development banks, and the government for their con constant trust in working together to recover and build back better. In the end, solidarity and unity, I believe these are the underlying principles that should drive us all in this moment of crisis. So in this vein, it gives me great pleasure to officially launch the joint SDG social protection program in Barbados, St. Lucia and the OECS. Thank you very much again for your participation to today. And I look forward to the remarks of uh, Minister Ford, Minister Leonard Montout, and OECS representative, and here as well, comments and questions for the various, from the various participants. Thank you very much again. Thank you, us with, oh, thank you Mr. Chirbuk for providing us with an overview of the joint program, which is the first initiative in the region financed by the Joint Sustainable Development Goal Fund, as well as sharing with us how the UN through this program aims to contribute to social protection in the region and the COVID-19 crisis. While building resilience to future related health, economic and climate shocks, as we work together to accelerate the region's progress towards implementation of the SDGs. We now move to the next segment of the launch where we will hear from the representatives of the three implementing partners of the joint program. I would like to first welcome the Honorable Cynthia Ford, Minister of People Empowerment and Elder Affairs for the Ministry of People Empowerment. It's the leading ministry from the government of Barbados with participation from the Ministry of Finance, Economic Affairs and Investment, the Ministry of Labor, and Social Partnership and the Ministry of Education and as well as the Department of Emergency Management. Mr. David Didier Trebu, UN Resident Coordinator for Barbados and the OECS. Honorable Leonard Montout, Minister of Equity, Social Justice and Empowerment, Youth Development, Sports and Local Government. Dr. Carling Radix, Head of Health and Acting Head of Human and Social Cluster, Social and Sustainable Division of the OECS. Dr. Alloy, 
UNICEF resident representative for Barbados and the Eastern Caribbean area. Mr. Regis Chapman, World Food Program representative, heads of all participating United Nations agencies. My permanent secretary, Mrs. Gabrielle Springer and her deputy, Dr. Jacqueline Wilshire, as well as other senior staff here in the Ministry of People Empowerment and Elder Affairs, other distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. I want to greet you with a proud Barbadian greeting and to thank all of you for sharing this very historic moment with us. The government of people of Barbados through the Ministry of People Empowerment and Elder Affairs, which has responsibility for some of our most vulnerable groups, including the destitute, elderly, disabled, and the children, express sincere appreciation for the support of this United Nations Sustainable Development Goals Joint Fund for Social Protection Program, which pivots on three main modalities, creating broad multi-stakeholder platforms, B, addressing multi-dimensional and complex priorities, and C, promoting dialogue amongst sectors and nations. As we are all aware, Barbados fully supports any collaboration which brings key stakeholders to the table for the empowerment of vulnerable communities. What is particularly heartening is that the program is grounded in the research, analysis, and aggressive monitoring and evaluation needed to support the evidence-based development of an adaptive system for social protection, one that can also serve as a model to sister states in the OECS region, sub-region. Indeed, while the program was initially framed under the Barbados Economic and the Transformation Program called BERT, the National Macroeconomic Strategy to maintain adequate social and economic spend, COVID-19 brought into extreme sharp focus the need for this project. While we struggled, like all other countries, to navigate these uncharted waters as a result of the pandemic, we were also made acutely aware of the deficiencies in our systems which had to be addressed and addressed with a measure of urgency. What we required was a more adaptive social protection system that will reliably withstand impacts, the likes of the economic downturn, climate change, and of course, public health crises. That is why this project, which we consider necessary even before COVID-19, has now become so critical if we are to sustain a social protection framework and the systems that will secure equitable and just distribution of the social services, leaving no one behind. We therefore especially welcome the repurposing of funds to deal with COVID-19 impacts that speaks volumes of the program's sensitivity to the needs of small island developing states, such as Barbados and St. Lucia, with most our most vulnerable global shocks. This will not only help us to best address our immediate COVID-19 needs, but will serve us well as we go forward, confident that people's vulnerabilities will not be intensified by future shocks. The fact too, that the program concentrates on three primary SDGs. SDG 1, no poverty. SDG 2, gender equality. And SDG 13, climate action. It's also commendable 
as these are indeed foundation goals that will help our countries to achieve significant gains in the other 14 SDGs. Faced with COVID-19 challenges, the government of Barbados, through the Ministry of People and Empowerment of and Elder Affairs, which has developed and implemented a number of initiatives which will become a part of our standard operations. These are, one, a social services emergency <coughs> operation center that stands up at the first sign of any socially related emergency. Two, a social services helpline which offers guidance, referrals, and hope to the vulnerable persons. Three, the distribution of nourishing care packages for the most immediate needs. And four, more rigorous contingency planning for service delivery. Certainly, our needs for even more meticulous emergency planning was brought to the fore when a cluster of staff members at our National Assistance Board that falls under the remit of the Ministry of People, Empowerment and Elder Affairs tested positive for COVID-19. This led us to the immediate temporary closure of the headquarters of the National Assistance Board. And you will know of the dislocation. The National Assistance Board is responsible for addressing matters relating to senior citizens. A component is provision of services to the vulnerable elderly in the communities through a home health program, which includes assistance with personal hygiene, cleaning, meal preparation, laundry, hair plaiting, barbering, and collection of medication and groceries among numerous other services. These services are provided to over 1,000 clients, 200 of whom are in need of care five days a week as they have no family or other support systems. These 200 persons are completely dependent on our services at the National Assistance Board for the very basic aspects of living we immediately had to formulate alternative means of looking after the needs of at least those, of the least of those who are most vulnerable, that 200 in number. So again, ladies and gentlemen, we would like to thank the SDGs Fund for financing this project so to, to, to support our COVID-19 responses. And as we go forward, with what seems to be emerging as our new normal. I wish to take this opportunity to express the gratitude of the engaging agencies for their input in this initiative on behalf of the government and the people of Barbados. And we pledge to work assiduously together to make sure that we empower our most vulnerable in our society and to promote them from dependence to independence, and of course, the higher level later, interdependence. I thank you. God bless you all. Thank you, Honorable Minister Ford. I would like now to welcome the Honorable Minister Leonard Maltut from the Ministry of Equity, Social Justice, Local Government and Empowerment for the Government of St. Lucia. The Ministry of Equity is one of the participating members, or ministries, I'm sorry, of the joint program along with the National Emergency Management Organization, the Ministry of Sustainable Development, the Ministry of Finance, Planning and Economic Development, as well as the Ministry of Infrastructure. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Didier Trebux, UN Resident Coordinator. Mr. Aloy Kumaraji, Representative of UNICEF for the Eastern Caribbean area. Mr. Regis Chapman, Head of, head of, of Office of Caribbean Preparedness 
and Response World Food Program. Honorable Cynthia Ford, Minister of People Empowerment and Elder Affairs in Barbados. Representatives of other UN participating organizations, such as UNDP, UNICEF, ILO, or UN Women. Uh, Dr. Carlin Radix, representative of OECS Commission. Ladies and gentlemen, I am extremely proud to address this virtual gathering today as a minister of the government of St. Lucia, and more so as the Minister for Equity, Social Justice, Local Government and Empowerment, the institution through which a number of key programs, program components under the Joint SDG Fund Program will be implemented or administered. I am particularly pleased at the foreseeable start of a project which will support much needed and long awaited reforms in the social protection landscape in St. Lucia. And as such, from the outset, I want to sincerely thank the UN Resident Coordinator's officer, officer and the various UN agencies, UNICEF, UFP, UNDP, ILO, and UN Women for investing in efforts to build the resilience of our people here in St. Lucia. Without a doubt, I believe that the activities of the support to be supported under this program will not only assist with a necessary redesign of our social protection system, but will fundamentally reshape or transform the system in such a way that facilitates people empowerment, resilience, resilience building, and ultimately sustainable development for our nation. I also want to express gratitude to our national authorities who have worked hard and with purpose to complete project preparation. I encourage continued partnership and collaboration during implementation towards the achievement of agreed outputs and outcomes. Ladies and gentlemen, the government of St. Lucia believes that supporting the poor and vulnerable is a fundamental prerequisite for achieving sustainable and inclusive growth. The government of the government also sus subscribes to the view that fundamentally, social protection is a human right, which is enshrined as such in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights 1948 and the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights 1966. Our constitution here in St. Lucia also makes provision for the protection of the fundamental rights and freedoms of individuals and for protection from discrimination on the grounds of race, sex, place of origin, political opinion, disability, etc. Within these frameworks and others, to include various international conventions that St. Lucia has signed on to, and taking into account the government's support to the social sector over the years, it is my view that the government of St. Lucia has and continues to explicitly show its dedication and commitment to addressing the needs of all vulnerable populations and to creating an enabling environment in which they can function optimally and contribute meaningfully. Consequently, within this context, I see immense value to the joint SDG fund program for social protection as it will complement government's efforts. That is in a significant way to achieve the requisite forms and the desired goals in this regard. Moreover, in reviewing the updated work plan for the program, I found immense satisfaction with the focus of planned activities in alignment with four key outputs, namely one, social protection system strengthening, two, social protection fiscal space, three, improved tools for social protection, four, piloting of shock response social protection cash transfer system. Indeed, these outputs and their respective activities reflect a progressive approach focused on evidence-based policy and programming, resilience strengthening and building human capital, an approach which also allows for divergence from traditional short-term responses to social ills and a reorientation and redirection of thought and effort towards long-term investment in social protection for sustainable development. This paradigm shift is critically important as highlighted, as highlighted by the existing situation brought about by COVID-19, which will inevitably demand long-term investments in social protection to effectively deal with the long-term social and economic impacts. Equally, equally important in the design of this program is the consideration given to the important issues of social 
protection fiscal space, particularly in view of the region's high vulnerability to multiple hazards. And so on this issue, and in agreement with Isabel Ortiz and others, I contend that it is hard to deny the urgent need for, government, for governments of the Caribbean region to, quote, aggressively explore options for expanding fiscal space to promote national socioeconomic development with jobs and social protection. I further echo the sentiments of Ortiz and others to say that today, at a time of fragile global recovery, austerity and slow growth, the need to create fiscal space has never been greater. As a final comment on the program design, I applaud the emphasis on shock responsive and adaptive social protection, given the island's susceptibility to external shocks and the unavoidable consequences of climate change. St. Lucia fully embraces and endorses this theme, as we believe that a social protection system that is designed to better anticipate and respond to shocks can play an important role in building the resilience of vulnerable households to better prepare for and cope with the impacts of stresses and shocks which are likely to occur at any time. In St. Lucia, over a, decade, over a decade, we have recognized the need to reform the social protection landscape for greater effectiveness and have experimented with various initiatives towards achievement of this objective. In that regard, I will take the liberty of sharing some of the small but meaningful strides that we have taken to address some of the structural challenges of the system. Of significance is the development of a national social protection policy in collaboration with local partners and with the support of UNICEF. This policy, which was approved by cabinet in 2015, provides a good administrative framework for the provision of adequate timely and sustainable social protection services to respond to the most prevalent risks and vulnerabilities of the population. Although forward thinking in its approach at the time, this policy will be reviewed and updated under the Human Capital Resilience Project, which is being supported by the World Bank to ensure that it is comprehensive and inclusive and that relevant cross-cutting themes such as gender, climate change adaptation, migration, resilience building, among others, are adequately considered and appropriately reflected. There is also a draft social protection bill 2015, which will be revised and updated under this program, thereby strengthening the legislative framework for the social protection in St. Lucia. A second area of tremendous progress has been achieved with, sorry, another area where tremendous progress has been achieved is with the development of an updated proxy means test, referred to as the St. Lucia National Eligibility Test. The adoption of this instrument by cabinet in August 2019 as the authoritative instrument for targeting all government means test programs in St. Lucia. The use of proxy means testing instruments is consistent with St. Lucia's national social protection policy, key principle, 4.2.1, which states the pro poor focus of social protection interventions will be improved through adherence to clear selection criteria, the use of efficient and objective targeting mechanisms, and subscription to inclusive legislation and program rules. Other gainful strides include improvements to the two key social safety net programs, that is, the public assistance program and the Coudme Set We See as well as the establishment of a rudimentary central beneficiary regist register in March of 2019. Notwithstanding progress over the years with respect to advancing St. Lucia's social development agenda, it is noted that poverty continues to remain high. The 2016 survey of living conditions and household budgets revealed that 25% of the population lives below the poverty line. Child poverty rates continue to remain high at 34.5%, and the poverty rate in female-headed households is even higher at 42.3%. And unemployment rate continues to remain high at 20.2%, with youth unemployment at 36.3%. Other social ills continue to challenge national growth and sustainable development. 
With this in mind, the government of St. Lucia and the Ministry of Equity, Social Justice, Local Government and Empowerment eagerly anticipates the implementation of this program, which is expected to contribute towards the creation of the desired enabling environment for the poor and vulnerable to have predictable access to universal and adaptive social protection. We also anticipate that the impact of the program on the fundamental need to reduce structural inequality, reduce poverty, and build resilience for sustainable development. Further, in our estimation, this joint program will also allow for progress towards achieving SDG 1, that is no poverty, in, particularly, in particular target 1.1, which refers to eradicating of extreme poverty for all people everywhere by 2030, and target 1.3, which speaks to implementing nationally appropriate social protection systems and measures for all, including flaws, and achieving sustainable coverage for the poor and the vulnerable by 2030. As the program is implemented, we also anticipate positive steps towards achieving SDG 13, climate action, in particular target 13.1, which calls for strengthening resilience and adaptive capacity to climate-related hazards and natural disasters in all countries. St. Lucia welcomes this opportunity to make a change where it matters and to work towards an equitable and sustainable nation. On behalf of the government and people of St. Lucia, I again extend sincere gratitude to the UN Resident Coordinator's Office and the UN partnering agencies for the kind assistance and support. I look forward to the successful implementation of this project over the next two years. Thank you very much. Thank you, Honorable Minister Montut. I would like now to welcome Dr. Carlene Radix, head of the health and acting head of human and the social cluster for the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States, who has been designated by Dr. Didicus Jules to represent the OACS today. Thank you very much, um, Honorable Leonard Montu, Minister of Equity, Social Justice, Local Government and Empowerment on behalf of the Government of St. Lucia. Honorable Cynthia Ford, Minister of People, Empowerment and Elder Affairs, of Barbados, uh, UN Resident Coordinator, Mr. Didier Trebek, distinguished representatives from the government of Barbados and St. Lucia, excellencies, members of the diplomatic corps, heads of UN agencies, funds and programs, development partners, members of the media. Uh, good morning or good afternoon, I think we're at. Um, it is really, first of all, let me bring greetings on behalf of Dr. Dilikas Jules, who sends his apologies um, as he had a competing engagement with this um, launch. But he certainly sends his, um, sends his greetings and his support for this very important event. Universal adaptive social protection to enhance resilience and acceleration of the sustainable development goals in the Eastern Caribbean. This uh, SDG fund addresses an important uh, area in the development for the region. And it works synergistically with the OECS strategic priorities. The first, um, specifically strategic priorities two and three, which speak to main, mainstreaming climate, economic, environmental, and social resilience. And by this, we mean that we are better able to adapt and recover quickly from adversity in climate, the environment, economic, and social systems as well as our strategic priorities three, to promote and support equity and social inclusion. And by this we mean create avenues of fairness and impartiality and ensure that no one is left behind. This of course is rooted in the first strategic priority of the OECS Commission, which is to advance and support and to accelerate regional trade, economic, and social 
integration. So doing things together helps us to move further. More specifically, in our social inclusion and protection framework, which has recently been revised, we look to two of the four pillars which are addressed with this joint fund. Building effective social protective responses, number one, and building human and community resilience. And I'm especially pleased with the shift in focus to COVID-19. COVID-19 has been an extreme challenge for all of our member states. I'm sorry. It's not just a new challenge, but a new opportunity. And it poses a challenge to our systems the world over. It also forces a rethink of the existing social protection responses and practices. This crisis, like others before, presents an opportunity to explore new approaches, to build new partnerships, and to collaborate more effectively across the UN agencies and across our member states. There's not a one-size-fits-all approach. Each of our countries and regions have unique characteristics, challenges, and vulnerabilities. Specifically, our small island developing states are very vulnerable. Some of the characteristics and vulnerabilities of small island developing states were noted in the OECD 2018 report of the same name. Small island developing states suffer the largest relative losses from natural disasters to which we are vulnerable. And we are now entering the next hurricane season. In 2017, many of our member states were significantly affected and our social protection mechanisms challenged as both Hurricane Irma and Maria affected multiple island states. Small island developing states were hit hardest by the global financial crisis of 2008. The economies of small island states rely on a narrow base of products and sectors. Uh, this report noted that tourism represents over 20% of the GDP for almost two thirds of small island developing states. Within the OECS region, that number jumped to 40% of GDP. The Eastern Caribbean region took swift and decisive action to contain the spread of the, of the COVID-19 disease, relying on basic public health measures of hygiene, quarantine, detection, contact tracing, isolation, and physical distancing and travel restrictions. And they have flattened the curve for all of our countries. However, there has been significant economic and social fallout. Preliminary assessments suggest that the economic impact is likely to be more severe than the 20, 2008 global financial crisis. And has already been pointed out, it's likely to be even more pronounced in small island developing states. Travel restrictions have devastated tourism and other related economic sectors. There's a domino effect. For the, for the supporting agriculture and service industries. With the loss of jobs, closures of schools, restrictions in movement, more people are in need of social protection me mechanisms. And the most vulnerable have had their situations exacerbated. Groups such as persons with disabilities, the elderly and the poor are further disadvantaged by movement restrictions. And there's more risk for child, gender, and elder abuse. A threat on this scale requires a response of equally unprecedented scale, and we need to work together in ways that we have never, that have never been considered before. To quote the Prime Minister of Barbados, this is a time for global moral leadership. The SDG joint program 
does just this, allows a way for us to collaborate together in ways that we have not before. The program plans to contribute to the development of an adaptive and universal social protection system in St. Lucia and Barbados through integrated policy development, program design, and service implementation. And this is indeed aligned to help the region address and cope with the living, with living in a COVID-19 era. The OECS Commission's Social Inclusion and Social Protection Strategy Framework gives attention to maintaining effective social protection response through strengthening institutional arrangements and the use of social protection to address the needs of the vulnerable, of vulnerabilities caused by climate-related and other shocks such as this. The, the funds, more specifically, will support the build out of a clear regional implementation plan for social protection, which will learn from the, the examples uh, set in St. Lucia and, and Barbados as we move forward. There's also a planned regional conference on universe, universal social protection in the first quarter of 2021. Of course, we will be using most likely modern technology as we are today to deliver this conference, which, was, which will allow for important exchange of information and best practices as we move forward as a region. Outside of the areas of the SEG Fund Joint Program, the OECS continues its role in coordinating with member states in collaboration with UNICEF and other agencies in the scale up of cash programs, as well as the delivery of psychosocial first aid during this traumatic period for many persons. In addition, the OECS has an education strategy specific to COVID-19 that takes into account the vulnerabilities of children. In conclusion, I want to say that this joint fund will go significantly to advancing the SDG goals, goal one to end poverty in all of its forms everywhere, and goal 10 to reduce inequalities alongside the OECS strategic priorities as we all strive to ensure that no one gets left behind. I thank you. Thank you, Dr. Radix. We would now like to open the floor to questions and answers. We will take a few questions through open mic. So we would appreciate if you raise your hand through the Zoom platform. Please be sure to indicate your name and organization when you're asking questions or making comments. While we may not be able to take everyone's questions, please still feel free to write your question in the chat box and we will make sure that you will receive a response after the launch. We remind participants that the event is being live streamed via YouTube and we encourage those that follow our social media to please repost this event. I'd now like to, I understand that one of our um, colleagues from the Caribbean Development Bank, uh, Ms. Monica LeBennett, who's the Vice President of Operations from the Caribbean Development Bank, would like to make a comment. Ms. Bennett, are you? Yes, are you hearing me? Yes, we are, thank you. Good. Um, Chair, representatives of the SDG Fund Joint Program Team, representatives from the governments of Barbados and the OECS member states, representatives of development partner institutions, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. It's our pleasure for CDB to join our partners for, from the UN agencies and from the governments of Barbados and the OECS to launch this important program that addresses the needs of the most vulnerable in our society. This launch is indeed very timely given the impact of COVID-19. 
Chair, COVID-19 has dominated our every waking moment over the past few months, turning our world upside down and transforming in significant ways how we live, how we work, how we interact with each other, hence this virtual launch. More than two months have passed since the WHO declared COVID-19 a global pandemic. As noted by several speakers, the impact of COVID-19 in our region has been considerable. In particular, on job losses, foreign exchange earnings, and remittance flows, which, are, which have all been disrupted. Government revenues have been slashed at the same time that expenditure on COVID-related responses have skyrocketed. Governments across the region are challenged to support those on their central beneficiaries registers. And this situation is compounded by an increasing number of recently unemployed persons from the formal and informal sectors who require at a minimum short-term income support. The pro proactive stance adopted by regional governments has saved many lives in the Caribbean, but the economic and social fallouts have been profound. The service-oriented economies, which employ a large number of women, have been particularly hard hit as a result of closed borders and physical distancing protocols. At CDB, we have developed a program of financial and technical support for our borrowing member countries. Along with our development partners, we intend to provide strategic assistance so that our BMCs can build and strengthen their social and economic resilience in the economic and social sectors over the medium and long term. To date, our board of directors has approved 143 million US dollars as part of a package of assistance to help the region to cope with COVID-19. Highest priority is being given to strengthening social safety nets. The bank is also in the process of developing its adaptive social protection strategy to provide short, medium, and long-term support to enhance shock responsive national systems necessary to protect hard-fought hard development gains. In addition, the bank's strategic approach is intended to provide a springboard for BMC's sustainable development beyond the impacts of the pandemic and as articulated in the respective development national plans and the SDGs. Our region is now entering a new phase of COVID-19. Many countries are beginning to ease restrictions, albeit cautiously. Clearly, we're not out of the woods, but uncertainties abound since the vaccine is still months away from being approved. In this new environment, our governments are being challenged to craft measures and strategies that offer adequate protection to every citizen, especially the most vulnerable among us. In that respect, as I said before, the launch of the program is very timely. I wish to express my best wishes for the successful implementation of the program and the bank's commitment to work with the partners on this important issue of social protection. I thank you. Thank you, Ms. LaVennett. I would now like to ask Mr. Clemente Avila of the World Bank Social Protection Cluster. Um, I understand that you also have a comment or a question, Mr. Avila. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I am Clemente Avila, Social Protection Economist at the World Bank. I mainly work in Mexico and the Caribbean, and in particular, I'm working in St. Lucia. I, I want to thank everyone for your remarks and congratulate the UN for this initiative and to the countries that you're working with in this endeavor for several reasons. No? First, the content of the initiative itself is highly relevant as it recognizes the need to expand social protection towards universal access to improve preparedness, responsiveness to shocks, and to facilitate and accelerate recovery after disasters, which is an agenda that the World Bank fully supports. We're happy to collaborate with all of you as development partners in these agendas. Second, because as has, as has been mentioned by, by many of you, the initiative couldn't be more timely. This was pertinent even before the COVID-19 crisis, and now it is even more important. No? COVID-19 is threatening to erase decades of economic progress and poverty reduction in the Caribbean. And we know that this crisis, as many others, 
will have disproportionate impacts on the poor through multiple channels. No? So this will mean uh, job loss, reduced wages, and in general, a drop in labor income, which is the main component of household income for the majority of households. Other channels uh, that, uh, through which the households will be affected is loss of remittances, potential rises in prices and disruption in key services such as education. And while many Caribbean countries, including the government of Barbados and St. Lucia, have reacted quickly to provide temporary relief to the most vulnerable and affected by this shock, it is important that international organizations do our part as well and support governments when it is most needed. This initiative uh, will support countries now in these difficult times. Lastly, I also want to highlight the approach of the initiative, the collaboration across UN agencies to better support governments, but also with other development partners like us, like the World Bank. From my own experience working in St. Lucia, I can say that the collaboration between the UN program and the World Bank now, under the, under the leadership of the Ministry of Equity in St. Lucia, has been great. We are now encountering multiple synergies with the SDG fund activities and the Human Capital Resilience Project by supporting in a coordinated manner. Let me underline coordinated. So the expansion of the main cash transfer program in St. Lucia, the public assistance program, complementing the technical analysis of the reform that are in progress to the legal and policy framework in social protection, to increase its flexibility and adaptability and lastly in supporting the modernization of the implementation of social programs on the ground and in other activities as well. I want to personally thank the resident coordinator and the team to Regis, to Sarah, to Francesca, Christina and to the whole UN team for this work, for this initiative and for their excellent cooperation on this important agenda and of course also to the governments that are leading this work in particular to uh, uh, honorable leonard montut minister of equity social justice local government and empowerment and to the permanent secretary in the same minister to belda Jasso. thank you all and we look forward to continuing working together thank you mr avila um, we are still available to take a few more questions. Um, if anyone wants to type in in the Q&A. You're more than welcome to and we will we will read it out and and ask the panelists. Mr. Richard Carter, I believe we have a question for Mr. Richard Carter. Mr. Carter, please go ahead. Hello, good afternoon. Um, thank you uh, to all of the persons participating here. Um, I am currently representing the government of Barbados. I work as the COVID-19 czar responsible for the coordination of the government's program in response to COVID-19, but my substantive role is as uh, the team lead for climate and disaster risk reduction with the UK Department for International Development. I just had a quick question in relation to the scheme that is being launched today. And to, to ask of the persons who are behind the scheme, what is the scope for the portability of social protection across multiple countries? particularly given the population mobility in the region. And we have been seeing a uh, particular vulnerability in migrant populations uh, as a consequence of not just COVID-19, but before that in relation to hurricanes and other natural disasters. And COVID-19 has particularly exposed uh, the vulnerability of some of these migrant populations as some of them have become stranded um, outside of their own countries and dependent on 
the social protection agencies for in the countries where they're stranded, but without that protection being necessarily available to them. So the question is the scope for portability across social protection systems in the subregion, which I believe would significantly reduce the level of vulnerability that we are seeing among those migrant populations. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Carter. We do have um, a typed in question from someone who has identified themselves as MH. Um, and I, I don't see, I don't see the full name or the organization, but I can certainly read the question. Um, the question starts with, although I would largely commend the government of Barbados and the Caribbean for their response to COVID, the gendered response has not been strong. We are not addressing needs such as access to safe childcare, single-headed households living on or below the poverty line, and access to services by women affected by IPV, the pandemic within the pandemic. How can we use this launch today to recenter goal five of the sustainable development goals, both as a macro and micro issue, as the single one needed for us to attain all others? Go ahead, please. please. Okay, thank you. Um, perhaps to respond to, to Mr. Carter's um, question on mobility and, and migrants, um, that was actually one of the aspects in the design of the joint program that, that was discussed based on experience um, in St. Lucia following the Hurricane Maria in 2017 and a number of Dominicans who, who migrated to St. Lucia and were eventually incorporated into a, a social protection support. Um, the program aims with the OECS Commission to conduct a study on migration and um, disaster responses and, and social protection as part of this program um, and, and within the policy coherence aspects and the work with the OECS is, asp is, a, is um, another area in which this topic will uh, be incorporated in this program. Obviously, in, in light of COVID-19, um, a number of the aspects of this program are being shifted. However, at the you know large part of this program and the the adaptive nature is around some of the natural hazards that the Caribbean, both with and without COVID, continues to experience. And and we've already seen um, this year, even before the official start of hurricane season, the Caribbean has already had two named storms, um, and we have a forecast for a above normal hurricane season. So this combination of both COVID-19, um, but also some of the natural hazards that the, the, the sub-region is exposed to make this topic of, of mobility and migration quite an important one as we look at social protection and universality of social protection. Thank you, Mr. Chapman. Um, I do have an update um, from Ms. Marsha Hines, who asked the question related to gender, the gender component. She is the president of the National Organization of Women of Barbados and an advocate. Yeah, the, the question, uh, related to gender is um, specifically how can uh, we use this lunch to recenter the SDG goal number five, both as macro and micro issues, as one needed to attend all others. O of course, gender equality is one of the goals, the three goals, as many uh, speakers uh, have um, uh, recalled. Uh, and gender uh, is mentioned across all the, 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 the program. So, the, you know, uh, it's clear that uh, uh, basing 
policies uh, on evidence that allows uh, countries to better understand the disparities, uh, that will be instrumental to ensure that depending on the context, whether in Barbados uh, uh, and uh, St. Lucia, to better, to, to better target uh, the beneficiaries. We all know that uh, women, women, girls, are um, affected in a disproportionate manner by the different shocks, whether uh, they are natural dis disasters, uh, economic shocks. Uh, and we have uh, even seen for the current uh, emergency, the COVID-19, affects more, more uh, women and uh, girls. Uh, on the economic side, for instance, we know that the industry that, uh, that is most affected is the, the, the tourism, and more women are working in the tu tur tourism sector. For, obviously, they are the, the worst affected. We talk about gender-based violence against women, against children. Of course, COVID-19 actually compounds, compounds um, that, that issue. Of course, of course, the, this program should contribute to um, uh, focus, uh, to, to contribute significantly to, to, to reduce uh, uh, gender inequality. Um, is it okay if I come in here? Of course. Sure. I I just wanted to add to the to what was said around the the regional approach, certainly within the OECS, um, with the revised Treaty of Basel, the Bogor Protocol member states. We are looking at the issues of um, of of free movement of persons among countries, and along with that, the the rights to access social protection mechanisms. And so the ability to, to, to harmonize and to have um, joint policy as we move forward with this process and to learn and adapt accordingly is, is something that um, this, this uh, fund will help move the needle that much more forward. And let me just um, say thank you for being an advocate and, and for using every platform to, to um, remind us of, of um, women who may be affected, especially in this time. Thank you both for your answers and your comments. Um, I, Mr. Uh, Minister Montout, I noticed that you raised your hand. Would you like to make a comment or ask a question at this time? Hi, Shireen. Uh, Tommy Descamp from St. Lucia. Um, so I'm really uh, here with Mr. Montout, but I'm the one who was asking the question. Oh, uh, great. So certainly it's not so much a question, but um, rather a, a, a suggestion and perhaps to the, to the RST. So we note that there's significant amount of unemployment that has resulted as a, uh, as, as a result of, of COVID. And to what extent that the, perhaps the UN system and even OECS can now put on their agenda the issue of unemployment insurance. Because um, clearly a lot of this, these, in, these interventions that we have put in power are short term in, in a sense to, in, to respond to COVID. But there is a great need to, to sort of have a, a sort of in, unemployment insurance framework in place that could respond to future shocks of that nature. So it was just get to, to uh, the RC. I know that ILO is not on the call, but perhaps it's something that we could consider uh, for the future. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comments. Um, I understand that we have a colleague um, who is the special envoy of the Premier of the British Virgin Islands. Um, his name is Mr. Benito Wheatley. Mr. Wheatley, are you, are you available for, oh, there you are, great. Please go ahead, Mr. Wheatley. Good afternoon. Uh, just, uh, I just wanted to say 
thank you to all the stakeholders for the launch of this program, which is very timely. Uh, we would very much welcome participation, given our own challenges as we uh, combat and respond to uh, COVID-19. Um, we are hoping that the program is open to all uh, islands affected in the, in the um, sub-region. I uh, would welcome if Mr. Trebuk could speak to that. Thank you. Facebook, please feel free when you are ready. Hello, yes. Um, good, uh, good afternoon. Uh, and thank you for joining from the British Virgin Islands. And good, good to, to see you virtually again. Uh, yes, I, I can confirm that uh, through the partnership with the organization, Western Caribbean states, we do expect to um, uh, somehow replicate those this type of initiative, social, uh, shock responsive social protection in um, the whole sub-region of the Eastern Caribbean. Um, for now, the interventions are really focused in, in Barbados and in St. Lucia to build on what exists and really to uh, pilot some models as it has been presented today. Um, but we look forward in the future, uh, Mr. Whitley, to, um, through uh, the OECS, uh, to have even in the region uh, a, a social protection strategy and policy to be adopted under the, um, the policy uh, binding mechanisms of the OECS. Uh, and that can open doors, of course, uh, through our various partners. You have heard um, uh, World Bank, CDB, of course, here. Uh, very much uh, involved into similar activities on social protection. So uh, this is the type of coalition that can help also to further expand uh, the coverage of social protection in the region, in particular also the overseas territories. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, we also have a question from a uh, journalist from Trinidad Newsday, Mr. Ryan Hamilton Davis. Um, he is asking, how can this fund assist in the short term, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic? Can the fund be accessed immediately? Is the fund in its current state able to have a significant effect on social issues that we are facing right now? There's a few more questions about logistics. Um, how will the logistical aspects be handled? And how will the funds be transferred to the social programs? It's quite a few questions. Um, I can read out the, them again, but um, he's, Mr. Davis is first asking, how can the fund assist in the short term, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic? And can it be accessed immediately? Mm -hmm. okay. okay, thank you. A very good question. I think as several of the speakers have mentioned, um, COVID-19 obviously has, um, after the initial design of the program, has, has informed a, a partial repurposing of the program. Um, across the, the board, across the five agencies that are, that are working with the two different governments and the OECS Commission, we've done an analysis to look at how specifically COVID-19 uh, needs to inform a, a refocus. Uh, to give a couple quick examples, in one of the, I believe Minister Montout had mentioned a community level piloting uh, that had initially been planned to take place later in the, in the program in 2021. However, as a result of COVID-19, that has also been pulled forward um, we have been able to utilize SDG funds through this program to increase the uh, number of beneficiaries that will be reached under the public assistance program in St. Lucia. Additional resources from other sources outside of this fund have also been able to, to be mobilized to help with that expansion. And that expansion is quite critical in a number of ways. One, obviously, because of the increased 
unemployment, the increased social uh, issues related to COVID-19, but it also helps to bridge a gap to um, a, a, a more permanent expansion, let's say, of that program um, with support from the World Bank, as was mentioned by, by Clemente, the World Bank colleague earlier. Um, in Barbados, similar discussions on how the original design needs to be adapted to take into account COVID-19. So really the, the adaptive nature of social protection I think is being tested at its core through a shock that, that was something perhaps that was not immediately at the, the front of our minds when this program was designed, but is obviously quite relevant today. Um, I think in terms of some of the other questions that are asked there, Logistics is obviously um, one that we'll continuously have to navigate as and when the situation evolves. Um, certainly programs, social programs around the world are being forced or, or, or need to take into account social distancing and other mechanisms to, to allow for, uh, to ensure safety of people involved in those programs. Obviously travel between countries is still an issue that, that is not uh, possible, but as and when conditions change, then, then we'll need to continuously adapt both as a UN and I think with the two governments uh, and, and the OECS commission involved in this program. Um, maybe I leave it there if yeah. Eloise would. Yeah, yeah. maybe I, I may comment how, on how uh, we plan to maximize the impact because you, you're talking about how, how uh, do we ensure that there is significant effect on social issues uh, uh, first uh, right now. It, it, it's, a, it's a catalytic fund, which is meant to leverage partnership, Partner, partnership uh, building on all UN assets, because you see this, this is about putting together the assets, uh, uh, the comparative advantage of five UN agencies, and uh, ensuring uh, um, during implementation with uh, the countries, uh, Barbados, St. Lucia, as well as uh, OECS Commission, in, in ensuring uh, that we, we come up with uh, uh, a greater coordinated uh, response from the different partners, starting first of all by the government agencies uh, itself, because it's, it's about ensuring a, a whole government approach, because when you talk about uh, social protection, you, you, you have several entities uh, in the government that are involved. So then, we, and as you know, one of the challenges is about fragmentation. And we see that across the, the Eastern Caribbean and in other regions. So, so to, to try to, to, to have this uh, whole of government approach, as well as, uh, as um, other development uh, partners that are involved, in the um, social protection to ensure that there is a great sy synergy, complementarity, so that we may ensure that, that, that we increase the reach, we, we reach uh, more um, vulnerable people. If I may add, if I may add just um, perhaps one more point on this. and, and uh, you know, the, the joint SDG fund, I think, is, is an opportunity for collectively the United Nations, Nations system to work with the two governments and the OECS in a much more intensified way to help to adapt social protection programs in light of COVID-19. However, the resident coordinator had also mentioned before the multi-sectoral response plan, and, and this is where the UN and, and is bringing some of these capacities beyond those two countries. So perhaps to answer the, the comment by, by Mr. Wheatley from BVI, um, you know, the World Food Program, UNICEF have worked consistently with, with the Ministry of Health and Social uh, Development in, in BVI since 2017. Um, WFP is supporting the ministry now to look at how social protection programs can be scaled up in light of COVID-19, looking at targeting and beneficiary selection issues. 
And perhaps to circle back to the question on gender, because the St. Lucia program in particular um, has several links to, to uh, women within the public assistance program and how they can be linked to care services. And at the regional level, UN Women is also supporting statistical services unit um, and, and the measurement of unpaid care work for the first time ever. So there's, there's quite a lot to, Lois had mentioned the mainstreaming, but there also are a number of gender specific actions embedded within the program as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. I understand that Mr. Carter has another comment. Mr. Richard Carter of the government of Barbados. Sorry, it wasn't so much a comment. I just wanted to uh, respond to provide a bit of information in relation to the question that was posed on unemployment insurance and to indicate that Barbados does have quite significant experience of uh, unemployment insurance because that has been a, a feature of the social protection program in Barbados for over 40 years, having been established in July 1981. And um, Barbados obviously um, does have quite a, a, an advanced uh, social protection and extensive social protection program. So its experiences are there at the disposal of any of the regional governments that would be interested in pursuing this. Much. Um, I understand that we have a comment or a question from Minister Ford. I think you're still, you're muted. This is yeah. Mrs. Marcia Heinzlin had made a query, a comment about gender. And uh, we are all aware of the excellent work that we've been doing over the many years in Barbados with the women and uh, of course our children and our boys. And uh, we will continue to work with the single-headed households. This project will assist us in helping to reach out further. Since we were doing some investigations over the past year and a half in relation to our vulnerable households, our vulnerable people, and many of them will be the single-headed households, particularly by women. And so we will continue to strengthen those areas. We've been doing the investigations the reporting is coming in, the information is coming in. But even before COVID kicked in, this government had made many strides in working towards immigration because we do know we have many people from the Caribbean and other areas who are living in Barbados and are undocumented. And therefore the Minister of Home Affairs has started working assiduously with the upgrades of the legislation and the amendments to be recommended has already come to Parliament, to Cabinet, so that we can ensure that those living among us get the necessary care and attention. And of course, employment as is required. We have been able to work with them during COVID, making sure that people are fed and they are clothed and housed. And we shall continue And this project and the funding will help us to be able to work closer with other agencies, ensuring that the lives of women and children in particular, and of course our elderly in this society, we see the necessary care and attention to ensure that their quality of life is improved or sustained once it is in, at that level. And so we are going to continue. I'm not gonna spend time in this um, in, um, environment to talk about what has been taking place at this moment, but I could just touch on two areas with the Household Survival Fund, where we are ensuring that households that have been headed by women, particularly those with children, that they are given the debit, debit cards to keep them alive at this time because we know that the curfew has impacted on many of them and persons will not have been able to get out to their work to be able to do the necessary things to keep families together. We are conscious that in a time like this, the COVID, persons having to be at home, there may be increases in domestic violence and neglect and so on, but the agencies are working together to make sure that whenever those kinds of discrepancies show their ugly heads, 
that, that, that the measures would be put in place to safeguard our women, our children, our men, our elderly, the disabled, and any other individual, because we believe in human rights and upholding those standards as far as possible. And the agencies are actually working with us to be able to ensure that that quality life is extended to all and that nobody is left behind. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Ford. Um, I've just been notified on, on a time basis that um, we will now move to, um, to some closing remarks by the resident coordinator, Mr. Didier Trebu. Thank you, Sharon. And well, first, I, I really want to thank you all for your participation in this launch today. Um, thank you, Minister Ford. Uh, thank you, Minister Montout. And um, thank you, uh, Kalin Radix from the OECS. We look forward to working uh, very intensively or continue our partnership with, uh, with you and, and your teams. Um, we're very, very excited. Uh, this is, of course, just the beginning of a new initiative, and we're building, of course, on uh, already a lot of work that has been done, as we have discussed today, especially in this COVID context. Um, I want to thank also colleagues from uh, CDB, uh, Monica Labenet, uh, who uh, has expressed, uh, as expected, of course, the bank commitment to work together on uh, social protection in the region. Mr. Avila from uh, the World Bank, too, um, who expresses a strong desire to collaborate in this adaptive social protection agenda. So I think as a result of this uh, discussion today, we all agree that um, the need to roll out this approach of shock responsive social protection is uh, more important than ever necessary. Uh, so we look forward to uh, working with you all on this. As my colleague said, this is a catalytic program. It comes with some amount of funds, but uh, the objective really is to build a wider coalition and to maximize the impact so that we can uh, not only implement rapidly the expected changes in Barbados and uh, St. Lucia, but as well to expand further, as I'm sure there are a lot of expectation to in other uh, Eastern Caribbean islands um, that to develop this approach too. So thank you very much for your time today. And uh, we look forward to continue the debate and uh, of course to uh, uh, enhance and, and strengthen this collaboration, which is already extremely promising. And I wish you all a, a very good weekend and most importantly, stay very safe uh, during uh, the coming days. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Trebuk. Ladies and gentlemen, we thank you all for your participation today for the launch and we wish you a pleasant and safe weekend. Thank you. Thank you and the same to all of you. Thank you and goodbye.